I am Nate Angel. I'm calling to you from Portland, Oregon, uh, which is also uh, the unceded land uh, and the territories of several different indigenous peoples um, that uh, are actually too numerous to name because it's quite a hot spot for, for indigenous culture for, for many, many centuries. Um, and I'm super uh, excited and honored here today to invite somebody uh, to have a conversation with us who I'm just meeting today for the first time. Um, and I'm and I'm so happy, uh, so happy to to have that chance to meet um, Taskeen Adam, um, who we will get to know uh, a, a bit better in a little bit. Um, but uh, Taskeen, would you like to at least uh, greet the folks and um, say hello and tell us where you're calling in from? Hi everyone, and I see a few familiar faces here, so nice to see old friends and colleagues again. Um, I'm calling in from the US today um, in Louisiana and looking forward to a great session. Great, I didn't realize you were in Louisiana. That's much closer than I thought you were gonna be. <laughs> so I'm from <laughs> South Africa, but just in, uh, in Louisiana at the moment. That's great. How's the, how's the weather down there in Louisiana? It's hot. Yeah, my plans are to go get ice cream after this. <laughs> oh yeah, I would like to get ice cream too. Mm, what's your favorite flavor? So interestingly, it's the Peach Festival in Louisiana. So um, hoping to get peach ice cream after this. Great. Well, uh, I I fresh peach ice cream is uh, yeah, it's so good when when the peaches are good. So you got to get them in season, right? I love that. I love a peach ice cream too. I just love ice cream in general. We have a big argument at our house about whether ice cream or cheesecake is the better dessert, and I'm on the ice cream side. But you know, it's not that I don't like cheesecake. So uh, hey, before we get started with the the formal program, if you will, um, I thought it might be uh, fun for us just to spend. Um, a few minutes getting to know each other. Although I think just judging by everybody I see in the crowd, I think a lot of people may know each other already. And so I, I uh, came up with this idea for something for us to talk about. Um, and I'm actually gonna send us into breakout rooms for five minutes to have this conversation. And I came up with this idea actually in reading a little bit and learning a little bit more about Taskeen's background because I learned that she actually has a whole background that's very separate from, no, not maybe totally separate, but quite a bit different than the work that she does today. And she has some skills and understandings in some, um, in some deeper areas uh, that, uh, that you know, don't really necessarily connect with her day-to-day -day work right now. Although they might, because I don't really know. And I just made me think that a lot of us have those, uh, those things in our background where we've like learned how to do something for one reason or another. Maybe it was a different job or maybe it was a hobby or just something that we learned how to do even as a, as a younger person. And I was thinking that it might be a nice way to get to know each other to actually spend a little bit of time sharing uh, one of those things uh, with, with another person. And so I'm gonna send us all into breakout rooms with just two people per breakout room for five minutes to each uh, th think about something that's kind of, um, uh, that you know how to do that's unexpected or maybe not part of your work now and just share it with that other person and have a conversation and get to know each other. Um, my example is I actually know how to build uh, rebuild engines, which I never do because I actually Wish cars would just go away now, but um, that's another story. So give me a second to um, set up the uh, breakout rooms here. And if anybody has any questions about this prompt, uh, sh shoot now and we will, uh, we will discuss it. Okay, well, everyone else has now filed back into the main room and I hope that you enjoyed talking with each other around this prompt. Um, some of us ended up talking about it here uh, in the room. You heard the tail end of that with Elizabeth who learns a new language every year, it's amazing. Um, but now uh, I wanted to get us started on the main program. And we're actually, there's there's not a bunch of slides with this. This is really mostly a, a conversation with Taskeen. And so I wanted to just um, uh, highlight Taskeen for y'all who is going to be speaking on, um, you know, the, the ultimate theme of our meeting here today. Let me just continue to flip through all the slides. So the title again, Decolonizing Open Education, Ethics, Epistemology, Equity, and Power. Wow, big important words. Um, so can't wait to hear what Taskeen has to say about that. Um, and I'm really honored uh, to have Taskeen here. Uh, this is the first time I've actually met Taskeen. And so um, I would, um, as all of you probably are. I'm really um, interested to hear what she has to say. 
And after she's done talking for a bit, well, we can continue to have some more conversation. Um, and then we'll have the opportunity to actually uh, take a look at a, uh, a reading that um, Taskeen co-authored with some other folks, that some of whom are all also on the call. And um, uh, we can then, uh, if we want, uh, go away and spend some time have continuing the conversation in the margins of that work by using social annotation, which I'll give you a quick primer on how to use uh, later after we're, we're done talking to Taskeen. So Taskeen, I will now be quiet and give you a chance to uh, say more about yourself in, as an introduction and, and then let us hear what you, you brought for us today. All right, thank you so much for, for um, having me today. Um, I'm actually quite like just in reflection about thinking about what I wanted to say today. Um, I thought it was quite apt because the piece that we're going to be annotating a bit later. Um, I learned so much from the margins of writing that piece with the colleagues, some of them whom are on the call today, like um, Catherine, Maha, um, many, many others. Like we learned so much in that conversations in the margins. Like, you know, it's almost like this gets into the final version, but the little chats you have on the side shape so much of what you know and have almost contributed to what I'm going to prepare present um, now, which is more of my um, much later thoughts on the topics of equity, epistemology, and power um, uh, that arose from my, my PhD research. So I'm sort of going to just share a little bit of uh, snippets, uh, interesting frameworks and things that I've, I've developed and thought about and really happy to share and grow. And I would like love it if like in two years time, I could refer back to this conversation and think about like, how, you know, where our point, where our thinking was at that stage and how it has developed going on. Um, so I guess let me just like jump straight in then. Um, I always like to start off like from the place that I know, which is South Africa and um, the inequality that has been um, present in South Africa, one of the most unequal um, countries in the world where we have some who are living sort of in this very high developed world and then the rest um, living um, with informal housing, uh, lack of ac uh, access to um, you know, decent infrastructure and resources. And kind of just bringing that layer on um, within the sector of, well, actually just looking at how COVID impacted that. So um, during COVID, um, we all know the you know school closures. We know what happened. Um, well, you know the strain on learners, the strain on teachers, um, shifting the pivot online, um, and all of that, and and sort of have up that that caused um, within the education space. And within those conversations, I always found myself drawn into sort of two extremes. On the one side, within uh, more privileged groups or even more just university or academic spaces. Um, there was this talk talks about, you know, the pivot online in terms of how do we, you know, teach synchronously and asynchronously? How do we do online assessments? Conversations of proctoring came up. Um, how do we shift from face-to-face -face pedagogies to digital pedagogies to critical digital pedagogies? Um, what's the best LMS? What, what's the best video platform to use? Um, and that was sort of on like one side of things, which were really important conversations to, to you know, to keep teaching and learning continuing um, in the virtual space. And then on the other side, there were issues of lack of access to electricity or students not having devices or sharing devices or the stresses that are happening at home, the cost of data, thing, things in South Africa, like students would go to school in order to access school feeding programs, right? Like that's not a thing you automatically associate with schools closing down, but like, where do they get their nutrition from if schools are closed? So you can see that, you know, everybody was impacted and, but there was sort of a different shift in focuses of these conversations. Um, so that kind of is like the background to, to these discussions of equity and, um, uh, you know, inequality in, in this, in the space and how how it's shaped over the past two years, especially since we've written that piece, and um, some of my my PhD basically focused on looking at injustices in MOOCs, which also looked at then injustices in the open education space, and I looked at um, things about 
uh, first from a from a country perspective or from a regional perspective, you could say where, uh, and these stats are quite are quite dated. You can see the dates on them, but I think they I don't think much has changed in that time. Things probably did get a bit better, but uh, or a bit worse in COVID. I I wouldn't know. Um, but yeah, if you just look at the the OER resources, only one percent come from Africa. When we look at MOOC production and the amount of, of Black presenters or, or people of color, it was almost like 1.7 and 1.1% in MOOCs, and only 7.3% of courses on Coursera was from the Global South in um, 2019. I do think that has changed quite a lot since then, but I think the, you know, the massiveness of that inequality is, is still there. Um, so these are just looking at the, you know, those those different shapings. And so within within my research, I sort of broke down the critiques of, and I think um, the the open education space has almost moved uh, and shifted into um, a more critical perspective. I think we're all thinking about this right now. Um, back in 2017, 2018, when a couple of us were still that fringe um, group pushing these ideas. Uh, from the side. I recently attended CIES um, a, a few weeks ago, and there were more than like 10 sessions about decolonizing and justice. And like, it wasn't just that one fringe ses session, but it was actually rooted into the, the, the conference itself, which is like really great to see how the, this is not fringe thinking anymore, but brought into the mainstream. I think the main thing there is it's not making it a fad or a tick box but actually like practicing what you preach. So looking at these three levels, I think with, within the open education space, um, the first critique was about like open washing. And we saw that happen a lot with MOOCs um, when openness was used as a branding or marketing statement. But then when you actually dug into it, the content might not have been shareable um, or downloadable or things like that. There were still many barriers to access. Um, then moving to that was the social injustice critique. And this was uh, where openness in itself was problematized and not as not good in and of itself. So that openness does not equal to equity, but that you need further layers onto it. So just providing resources not, might not be good enough, but you also have to look at it from, you know, the ability to access those resources and benefit from it. Um, and then the neo-colonial critique very much built upon the social justice critique, but I think it just emphasizes the geopolitical dimensions a bit more. So not just that um, openness does not equal equity, but also that it might be unequal for different groups as well. Um, so it might not be a universal good for everyone. Um, and this problematized uh, things like language issues from who is the creators, uh, who are the producers, who are the recipients, uh, do do people in the global south have um, funding to become producers? Um, questions like that. Whose knowledges are, are privileged um, in this? Who can who can which type of institute has ability to create a MOOC, for example? So these were the three different um, angles that we sort of unpacked there. And so within my research, I kind of drew on two different um, streams. One was the social justice frameworks. Um, and the other was about the uh, decolonial de frameworks that I'll switch to in a bit. But um, the, I really tried to unpack what this understanding of like socially just education or open education was. And I read around on different sources and there were like two streams that seemed to have converged. So the one was the social justice frameworks and many of these did originate from um, the global north, like, you know, our, our philosophers uh, like Rawls and, and just going back historically, looking at concepts even from, from Greek understanding of justice, right down to um, how those have been more embedded into even South African works like uh, Lockett and Shea. So looking at these switching from social justice just as re uh, redistributive to looking at it as reframing and re-acculturation re which is basically about including different perspectives, um, but also understanding that they are all fallible as well. Um, and then bringing the issue of, of rights and, and those geopolitical dimensions. Um, then on the other side, 
let me actually just switch to here, um, was the uh, decolonial understandings, right? So looking at what uh, decoloniality meant. And um, the, the whole decolonial movement was somehow more global South led from South Africa, from Latin America, from South Asia, different groups of people around the world had have, have been sort of um, working on that. And the idea of uh, decoloniality was that, uh, you know, colonization might have ended, but that rooted ingrained thinking, that colonial thinking would have continued as well as the indirect forms of power and rule that, that impact um, how we function in today's society. Um, in just kind of shifting over that into like digital neocolonialism is that looking at it not just as like a country influencing either directly or indirectly on another country but also um tech techno capitalists big big or uh, big um you know um tech industries and how they are influencing the space especially in the ed tech space so just looking at decoloniality it also has like multiple levels of meaning and um when we when we look at that it can it can come across as and these are all different and almost contradictory and something i want to emphasize here on the understanding of decoloniality is that it's not one meaning um it is contested there are many it's its own school of thought that has many debates circulating in terms of what it is um i think in in many of these spaces it's much easier to pinpoint what the problem is but talking about a solution and a way forward is much harder. How to resolve that problem is much harder. And so just highlighting the three different ways that um, it, like I've seen it come across. So one is Africanization. Um, it could come from like Ubuntu philosophies that want to um, focus on pushing out Euro, Euro, uh, European knowledges and focusing the local and indigenous knowledges. And this is really important when, when these knowledges haven't been recognized before and need a, its own space to grow and develop into um, a, a more fully fledged school of thought. Uh, but it can also be co-opted, like realistically, it can be co-opted by governments who are trying to push a national agenda. So there's, there's always pros and cons to that. Afrocentrism is less about um, you know, a complete replacement, but a recentering. Uh, but then again, yeah, um, we also have to be conscious of like the romanticizing of that. So just to say that because something comes from a specific region um, might, does not mean it's that it's infallible. Um, another aspect to look at here is that we're not just going back in time to, uh, you know, for example, African philosophy 50, 60, 100 years ago. We evolve, culture is evolving and growing. And so we need to also look at the identities we formed now um, and not just um, romanticizing the past in that in that sense. And the last one is knowledge as entanglement, which which then looks at knowledge as this idea of um, traversing space and time. So evolving um, through different uh, cultures and communities and shaping over history, like thinking about, you know, how um, Greek philosophy might have influenced Islamic philosophy who yeah, and, and so on and so forth, looking at that history over time. The, the challenge with this is the, the voices and the, the, the perspectives that have been marginalized will, will need to have, you need to spend explicit, you need to pay explicit attention to making those um, voices heard. Um, so growing these two frameworks together, what I drew together in my, my thesis was this dimensions of human injustice would focus on material injustices, cultural epistemic injustices, and geopolitical injustices, and, and how these three lenses uh, can be used to analyze a, a specific situation or course or, or process. Um, so I just wanna, I don't wanna spend too much time on it, but um, just looking at decolonizing open education, these are just some of the, the, the things we can talk or, or annotate about today, um, the idea of, of globalizing education. So when we have these platforms or these like, um, you know, open content that is for everyone um, whose knowledges are, are represented in them, it's normally dominant Western centric knowledges, values, norms, and beliefs um, in that. There's also the pedagogy of it, right? So who's what type of pedagogies um, 
are, are being forefronted. Um, a lot of personalized learning or edtech products focus on the individual. So looking at the individual's learning path and the assessment and often this arrival to a predetermined goal that then marks that, you know, then deems that now you have completed this assessment. So looking at more communitarian models or more critical um, expansive thinking of, you know, what is the end goal of that learning experience. Um, then have dominant languages, quarter periphery models where, you know, either the headquarters are based in, in, in Europe or in the USA, um, and then it's sort of packaged and, and sent to different parts in the global south. Um, then also then looking at technological design. And when we look at, there are many critiques of technological design, but it often looks at user friendliness or, you know, content design, but kind of pushing that forward to thinking about who is creating the design and what are the colonial logics that might be embedded in that. Um, the last point is adverse incorporation, which means that not everything can or should be di digitized or online or taught online. There are many ways of thinking and being and learning that need to happen um, face, well, you know, I'm not saying face, but I mean in person, right? That, that human element that needs to come, come across. Um, and I expand on that in some other talks. Um, how much time do I have, Nathan? Do I still have a few more minutes? Oh, oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, sure. So um, within, within my research on MOOCs, I looked at like four different ways that I break down uh, MOOCs. So the one was just like MOOCs that perpetuate injustices. Um, and this can either be inadvertently or in it intentionally um, that, you know, portray a specific, a specific narrative without saying that it's a specific narrative. So presenting it as the only objective truth on something. Um, then you get MOOCs. That, and, and you can replace MOOC with course. Yeah, I'm just speaking from my perspective. Um, that use open philosophies, but they don't necessarily address injustices. Um, and here you get this normally in, in the computer science types, type of fields where you know, they'd use open platforms or open uh, licensing tools, um, but still don't really get to the next level of ensuring that it's a just space. The third and fourth one are interesting because the third one, and I really struggled with these last two to decide like what is just and, you know, and I think they all, they, they both have their different goals. So the third one is that something strives for justice, but the actual person maybe receiving that course isn't the most marginalized. They might be the engineer or the journalist or the medic that benefits from this course, right? And their work that they do will in, in, in turn help um, more marginalized groups or, you know, create more equitable situations. For example, activism in journalism, right, which could help to advocate for, for more voices to be heard. Um, the fourth one is when, like, the MOOC or the course actually is aimed at including the marginalized group. So make sure that it addresses the resource constraints or the language barriers and um, really focuses on, on that. There was a great MOOC on education for all that really reached teachers um, in rural areas and allowed them to um, come into it through like, you know, um, blended learning models that incorporated like low face-to-face uh, -face groups as well as engaging in content. So that sort of thing is also possible. So within my MOOC research, um, there were like three key arguments that arose from it. And so the first one is that there is really no one size fits all framework to, to, to say what is a justice or socially just MOOC or justice orientated MOOC. And I split that up into justice as content, justice as pedagogy and justice as, pro as, um, justice as process at three different ways. Um, then the other one was that um, we often focus on the course and not the course designer, right? So looking at course designers themselves and ex ex uh, examining their subjectivities, their positionalities, because what my research showed was a strong correlation with who the person is, their lived experiences, and and you know their shaping their background and how that influenced how they teach. This is a general comment for all teaching and learning, not just for online teaching and learning, but but it bears stronger importance in the online space where you are teaching such diverse groups of participants. Um, and the last thing is about looking at course 
course design, um, not just what goes in it, but what's surrounding it. So looking at situating it. So not just the curriculum or the pedagogy, but what are the situations of, of learners um, in that space? Um, so I, based on all of these different aspects, looking at like equity and epistemology, I, I kind of drew this framework up for looking at how to um, approach socially just design. Um, and the first level was the framing. And so this happens at the bigger picture, at the institutional level. What are the decisions that they make? What platforms do they choose? Why do they choose it? Um, and interrogating those decisions. Because once you get into them, once you decide to go with a specific tool, um, that locks you in for a long time. So you really need to understand what are the decisions you make there. Um, and the second level is looking at um, conceptualizing um, here where uh, designers, course designers can interrogate their own um, understandings and biases and then um, looking at more situating the more which then focuses on those surrounding aspects. Um, and I, I'm happy to share like bigger slide decks with you if, if you would like to see more about this. Um, so let me skip over and let me maybe for the purposes of this conversation look at uh, some of the ways that I've con conceptualized target groups. Like when we're designing a course, um, one shouldn't just, you know, I think some of these are obvious, but like, do we consider when we have a student, what are the family or the parental responsibilities? What are their uh, financial responsibilities? Are they trying to do another job? How do we include flexibility in the space? Um, so kind of looking at all of those different things and the ones at the bottom also look at like differing cultural norms and religious views. How are we um, bringing that in? Um, different political views. Um, yeah, just, just thinking about who your target group is as well when you think about like, for example, universal design um, of learning. Um, and I guess I just want to touch more on the three categories I mentioned earlier. So justice as content. Um, this here looks at um, when we actually look, look, so let's say we do have a course that is a specific regional focus, right? So you could adapt the course to, for example, include different tribe groups in South Africa, you know, so we, we learn more about our, our different histories. Um, but once you go global, can you really say, okay, we want to represent every single culture in the world, right? That's when it doesn't hold up. So how do you do that? And that's when the pedagogical approaches come more in. That's when sharing and learning between different groups and stakeholders um, in, in, the, in the learning environment um, where you can co-create and learn from each other, where the pedagogy is, is more important. And the last one, justice as process, is um, kind of taking a step back and looking at who are the stakeholders that are involved in deciding what this course, what the content is going to be about, who is designing that curriculum, are students' voices heard, are practitioners involved? Um, so, so looking at that, uh, and I've seen all of these happening in different courses that I reviewed that were, were really interesting. Um, and I think this, this is a sort of last slide. I thought it was quite interesting for, for promoting some, so for encouraging some discussion, but, in my research, I looked at three different MOOCs or online courses that focused on uh, within this decolonial space, so a bit meta, but all, all of them were focusing on some sort of African decolonial discourses. But the first one um, did it from a managerial level. So the university decided that they wanted to um, have this um, course and they set it out, but they actually like sort of outsourced the content creation. So they had great content, but they didn't really do it in a co-creative way. Um, so they, they kind of had like a very top-down model. The second one um, was a student-led course. So students were trying to push for a more decolonial perspective and they did podcasts, they went around, they asked different students uh, to incorporate and include things into the curriculum. So it was a very co-creative process, but they didn't have the funding or the institutional backing. Um, and they were sort of this fringe, um, side of things. So when it came to the actual course, they didn't have uh, the ability to, to keep it running um, in a very interactive way. 
And the last one was um, done, done by a specific lecturer who promoted, uh, who, who shared thinking and he promoted a very Socratic method of teaching and learning uh, within so that it was very pedagogical in terms of uh, and critical in encouraging critical thinking. But it was very much shaped by, by um, that lecturer's perspective. So there was not much room for someone to co-create what was, or, you know, to be involved in the shaping of the design. So these are just the different processes. And I think I will stop there. Um, thank you. And I hope, hope that's uh, enough of uh, stimulation for some annotations going forward. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, Skeen, I have to, I think it was maybe too much. <laughs> People sorry, are over... and I speak fast, so I'm so sorry. No, it's <laughs> not. It's, it's not that it was too much. Um, yeah. You know, uh, for everyone, people are celebrating it. It's just it's a lot of information, and so mm -hmm. um, I think people were like, "Wow, it's, you know, uh, I need to ponder this and think about it even more deeply." Uh, the, the question has come up many times already. If you would be willing to share that slide deck oh. with everyone. Okay, and sorry, I did not look at any chat while. I'm That's talking, all right. So. <laughs> you, there was enough to look at on your screen too. I I didn't participate in chat that much because I was so busy also reading the slides. But yeah. That's such amazing work. I'm 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 actually kind of speechless because I'm just blown away. Um, this is my first introduction to your work, so, um, really really amazing. You've obviously spent a lot a lot of careful time thinking about all this and working on it. Um. And we do have, we have till the top of the hour as I actually only learned this year what top of the hour means. It's when the big hand gets to the top of the clock. Uh, <laughs> so we have till the top of the hour um, for some discussion. I don't know how long, if you can stay Tuskeen uh, till the top of the hour, Is that, will that work for you? Okay. Um, and so, so as not to make this uh, all about me, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of folks who might wanna uh, have something to say. Could we maybe use the, um, or have questions for tasking. Can we maybe use the um, the reactions button and raise hands uh, so we can bring folks in, in in some sort of sensical order? Because I bet there's a lot of people with stuff burbling around in their in their minds. Would someone like to raise their hand to get started with? Or maybe everybody's so blown away that they have nothing to say. There was lots of exclamations in the chat. Ah, Maha has raised her hand and Rebecca. Okay, Maha. This is kind of a cheeky question, but just like how long does it take you to create frameworks? Because these are like 10 frameworks that you created yourself and I'm just trying to figure out and you create one like every month or how does this happen? You think I create many frameworks? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the I, the main one that I use is is a, sort of the one with the three circles, uh, um, uh, sort of the material injustices, geopolitical injustices, and um, epistemic injustices. Um, yeah, so I don't have a response for that. I don't because I think things are constantly evolving. So like, yeah, maybe my mind is very categorical, and I do like to organize things. To, to help think think through. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not a very good answer. Ma. It's like you're, I feel like <laughs> every slide that you had was like an amazing infographic. <laughs> yeah, really. there, there was definitely some great, great um, visuals and, and structure there. Um, thank you for your presentation. I, you know, the thing, I, I have more of a comment than anything, really, because what it got me thinking about was the need for more diversity in instructional design, right? The need for more diversity in, in the fields of people that we go to to help us design our courses in the, in the first place, like, like that sort of aspect of things. Um, any thoughts or recommendations on how we diversify the field? <laughs> how we, how we, how we, yeah. How we highlight or how, how we make that happen. Yeah. I mean, um, I would like this to be a, a discussion by the way, not a Q and A. So please can other people jump in as well. Um, actually the one slide I slipped, uh, skipped over was about like, creating that, that that greater diversity within these spaces and thinking about how um, 
we can invite more guest speakers. So if we are in academic spaces, how do we get practitioners in? How do we get students? How do we get people working? I don't like the term on the ground, but like people with more practical experience about um, their teaching and learning, uh, like the, the topics that we are teaching about. So bringing them into the space because often not everyone is in, in that academic space. And we, we also wanna break down those barriers between uh, academia and practice as well. Anyone, anyone else have thoughts? I don't want to be the only one chipping in here. I could diversify responses to the, the question of diversification. Speaking as someone who's in practice rather than academia, uh, all I can say is I just don't know how I will implement even a fraction of this because it's so, you know, like I'm, it's just me. Um, and I'm really, I'm really driven to try and do it, but it's a huge task even for like a whole team of instructional designers working with lecturers and everything. There's a lot, a lot to, to, to chew on even before figuring out how to apply it. But I mean, it's, it's super inspiring. Like uh, it's just, I'm, yeah, it's prompting so much thought. It's making me want to go back to the drawing board with my next course. <laughs> and just like delay payment, <laughs> delay earning anything for a few months, who knows. <laughs> and I think, I think within the framework, that was kind of my point, like everybody looks at that like last layer of like creating and implementing, but so much needs to happen before that point and making those processes explicit, um, there's, you know, the table setting processes, um, the decision making framework so that happened before that is really important. Maybe there's also tiny threads that could be pulled on first. I mean, I agree, Lucy, it's, there's so many things that could be done by thinking this way, but I wonder if there's maybe just one thread that one could start to pull and that would actually <laughs> unravel a lot of different things that might cascade out from it. I don't know what that thread is. Maybe it's different in different situations. Well, what do people think that <laughs> that that thread might be? Lucy, was that that's what you came up to say? Um, you had your hand raised before, so yeah, it wasn't, but that that was more relevant. Ignore my previous hand. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> hands, the hands are diversifying as well. Laura, did you did you had something that you wanted to say? Yeah, I mean, this was fantastic. I'm looking at these frameworks in terms of how it can help me in the work I'm doing now as a, a writer, because I mean, so many of these same questions about content and audience and, and goals apply here. But I wanted to ask about MOOCs because MOOC has been sort of a four letter word in my vocabulary for a long time because of the terrible ways it was, MOOCs were implemented in a lot of US contexts. Like my school threw away literally millions of dollars on a MOOC platform that left nothing behind, no open resources, no content, no nothing. But I'm wondering now, like what, what do you see as the relevance of MOOCs going forward, Teskine, especially in an African context? I think, I think that's a really interesting question. I feel like MOOCs have actually just shed away this idea that they were trying to democratize or, or you know that slogan of democratizing access to education a lot of platforms even stop calling themselves MOOCs now and they just call themselves online platforms um, if you look at like edX joining to you and and all of these a lot of MOOC platforms have gone the commodified route where there's like paid versions of things um, the flip side of that is that uh, one of the um, I think the shortfalls in, in MOOCs was also the lack of, especially from maybe from a more Global South perspective, is like accreditation has always been important. And I feel like Sakena should speak here. She's much more, she knows much more about this than I do. Um, but like accreditation has always been that key thing. Like people want, it's not like just like, oh, we want to learn just for the sake of knowledge. People want to show that they can. And I think that's also what pushed um, that, that, um, that's segue in that way. So Gina, do you want to add in? I feel like you, you sure. have much more to say. Yeah. No, well, I can add a little bit. Thanks, Tusky. First of all, that's a really great presentation. And I'd love to explore the slides. I mean, I do know um, your work, uh, uh, you know, um, but I'd love to revisit those slides. Yeah, look, the whole MOOC story is very mixed. I mean, I, you know, if you look at it on the fa face of what 
what's happened with the big MOOC platforms, they have certainly had to develop business models for sustainability and they have gone the way probably as we could all have predicted, you know, in terms of follow the money and, and whatever. But I think there's, as you mentioned, a couple, you know, the MOOC as a form has captured the imagination of, of people who have been able to kind of reuse it in different contexts. Um, you know, that, that kind of at least the idea of openness in the sense of reaching large numbers of people from different parts of the world who can all come together in a kind of classroom space. If designed in a particular way with local context has opened up some education opportunities, I think, to, to groups that might not have. So I've been following the, you know, the there's the MOOC initiative for refugees, for example, um, which has been, you know, quite successful for professional development of teachers in Global South context. And certainly from the University of Cape Town point of view, we have a sort of small but, you know, uh, uh, um, in numbers, we have like almost 25 MOOCs on various platforms that have a particular local reason for doing it. Um, and I think you mentioned education for all being one of them and so on. And so we've seen the ability to kind of innovate within this space while acknowledging that these bigger platforms have. So I suppose what I'm saying is you don't have to align with the bigger um, imperative. Um, but certainly you're right about the kind of overblown um, issues and open washing and, and so on. So I think that, as always, sometimes it's in the margins where subversion can happen, right? And you can only see it from that margin. So I would say that some of the work that we've been doing and, and others have in Global South context have had to do that in a sense. Um, yeah, thanks. I also just want to add on that I think one of the, the really great things about MOOCs and it's especially the ones at UCT is that they bring about hot topics, topics that couldn't be discussed normally are not part of a formal curriculum. So they push thinking that could never happen within the normal curriculum. And hopefully what happens is that like, that is sort of a proof of concept that that is something that needs to be in, brought back into, um, you know, the, the, the formal um, curriculum of that topic so it's, it's a test bed almost for for pushing ideas and then also um, new surges of things whether it's COVID or refugee crises that that can then be addressed um, with them and also the it, it can also be the platform for sharing regional knowledges more widely so it's not just this unidirectional but it does provide the opportunity to to share those knowledges on the global platform as well. Askeen, uh, in the UCT, I assume that's University of Cape Town, right? Um, in, the, in that context, are they still using a Sakai-based platform for their for that kind of delivery, or is it something else, or is it many things? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I yeah. could probably so, answer that, that later. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, um, Future Learns yeah. for Sarah, Sakai is yeah. more of the internal platform gotcha. rather oh. than the, the, the student's LMS. But the, the MOOC platforms are broader. Yeah. We've just moved off Sakai Nate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everybody in, in everybody transition. gets there eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Was it to Canvas? Uh, bright space. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just checking. Um, well, hey, I noticed that we're getting um, close to the top of the hour again, um, and I really appreciate the, the conversation here, but we did say that we were gonna spend a couple of minutes thinking about how we could continue the conversation about the margins in the margins <laughs> on a reading uh, that Tuskeen had a part in um, in authoring. And so if if nobody else has any last minutes to say, I was just gonna introduce that and kind of uh, put it out as a spot for us to continue the conversation. We won't really be doing it here today, but it is uh, it actually makes more sense as an asynchronous activity. So if that makes sense, Tuskeen, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we shifted to that? No, oh, all good. All right, great. Well, I am going to share my screen again then. So this obviously is uh, a part of that collection that was authored by several different people, including uh, Taskeen and some others that are here in the audience, um, Breaking Open Ethics Epistemology 
epistemology, equity, and power. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, for those of you who aren't already familiar with social annotation, um, I no longer work, but I used to work for an organization called Hypothesis that um, makes a tool that enables um, kind of conversation on top of text, right? And so I thought it might be interesting for us as a group to maybe take some of the thinking that Tuskeen presented to us today and continue the conversation about that, the everything that she brought up in the context of this reading. Uh, and you can see here that uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with hypothesis, um, in this document, there are already some areas that are highlighted in yellow. And that actually means that Tuskeen has actually already gone in and done some annotation herself. So one thing that I wanted to show everybody a, a little secret about hypothesis that you may or may not know is that when in uh, a document like this has been annotated um, and annotation is enabled, you'll see these little controls in the upper right hand corner. And that opens this little sidebar. It's like a little portable margin for, uh, for these annotations. So you can see one of Tuskeen's there. But one of the handy things about Hypothesis is if you wanna share a document like this that's been annotated, but you wanna make sure that the annotation tool is embedded in that share, um, when, you, when you're annotating yourself and you look at the very top bar, there's this little you know, box with an arrow button. And that brings up a link that you can then use to share this document out with its annotations in context to other people. And so I'll put that in the chat now. Uh, it's also in, uh, it's linked on the last slide of the slide deck that I was using. Um, and so this is a really easy way. If you click on that link, it should just open up um, this uh, article and the annotation uh, sidebar, both in the same place. Now, the way uh, hypothesis annotation works is, um, when annotations are public, as um, Taskeens are here, uh, then uh, they're visible to you whether or not you have ever annotated or have an account or not, right? And so, you know, all her annotations that are already here in the margin are, should be visible to you. If you also would like to annotate or reply to an existing annotation, then you need to make a hypothesis account. I know there are many people in the audience I happen to know already have these, but you can, uh, you can see I'm already signed in up here at the top, but if you're not uh, signed in already, you can actually use this tool to sign up as well. Um, so we don't really have time to uh, actually start annotating today, but I at least wanted to point you all to this reading. And uh, you can see that um, there's a conversation already started in it by Tuskeen. Uh, and I would invite everybody to uh, actually join into that discussion when they have some time later after they've maybe spent some time um, digesting all the amazing uh, thoughts that were shared here today. The other thing that I was going to just uh, make sure that we had before we left is um, uh, the um, uh, Tuskeen, what's the best way for us to um, get to your slides? I wasn't sure if you had had a chance to share them in chat yet. Um, is it fine? Can we send it over email afterwards? I'll just sure. convert them to Google Slides and then share them around. Sure. There's also a bunch of other recorded presentations that I've done, um, like a I think I did a emerge workshop, which is a much this today was like a 20 minute smash in of, of what I did over one and a half hours in another place. <laughs> a much okay. more slower one. Yeah. Great. Yeah, just send everything to me and I will make sure that everybody who registered or attended the event um gets that that information. Um so then you'll be equipped with all that rich information from Tuskeen. You'll have the opportunity if you would like to take it to annotate um this document. I'll be diving into it as well. Um and then uh, the other thing I was just going to um, say that <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to be that person with the last word kind of situation here, um, but um, everything that you uh, presented today, Taskeen, reminded me of this um, project that a couple of people in the audience worked on, as I did too, uh, and I'm just putting a link to the chat in here. And this was a, a sort of like another framework, if you will, that one could use to maybe think about how to open up spaces. And um, in listening to your presentation, I was mostly thinking about how I would want to go back now and augment and, and revise this um, open learning experience bingo card. So any, if anybody hasn't seen that, I've shared the link in that as well. So we're about to wrap it up here. Taskeen, uh, any final, final thing you'd love to say to send the people off on their day? Hey, and thank you. Thank you for joining. And let's continue the discussion in the margins. I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great honor to have you here today.
Thank you so much for all of the coordination, Nick. No problem. And nice to meet you. <laughs> yes. Nice to meet all the new faces, yes. Yes, thank you all for coming. <laughs>